I told my dad, I'm going to go home early and put these groceries up. I'll meet you guys back at the house. So it was dark and I hit the garage door opener and I pulled my car in and I hit the opener for the door to come down. And as it started coming down, I saw it kick up in the rear view mirror. And I'm like, that's weird. And so I go to get out of the car and I look in the side view mirror and he's standing three feet from me and he's cocking a nine millimeter. He had snuck in the garage when I opened it. He had been waiting for uh, all of us. He didn't know I was going to come early by myself. He knew we were at football practice. He had parked his truck two miles away. He had dredged through the woods on the side of my house, jumped a creek. He brought an extra box of ammunition with him. He was wearing all black and he had on a gun holster. And when I opened that garage door, he snuck in and was getting ready to shoot me. And I saw him in the side view mirror. And immediately this voice took over in my head, you know, get out of this garage or you're dead. Now the garage door was coming down behind me, but I put my head down. I slammed that car in reverse and I hit the gas as hard as I could. And I busted through the garage door with the car. I was so scared he was going to shoot me in the head when I was going by him. Um, but because I wasn't looking, I smashed into a tree in my neighbor's yard. And when I did, it blew out my back windshield and um, it kicked me up. And I looked and here he is walking down the driveway at me with that gun pointed at me. And in my head, I'm like, okay, get away from this tree, get back to the street or you're dead. You, you got to get out of here. So I went to put the car in forward a little bit to get away from the tree to then reverse out to the street. And I hit the gas too hard and I careened across my driveway down a little embankment into the woods and I smashed into some trees. <clears throat> and um, I was kind of on a slight <clears throat> embankment and I turned and looked and here he is just a couple of feet from the, the window with the gun pointed at my head. So again, I ducked down. <clears throat> Somehow I got that passenger side door open and I tumbled out and I started running through the woods next to my house, screaming bloody murder. And I heard pop, pop, pop. And I felt stinging in my chest. And I was like, oh my God, I knew I'd been shot. And I was trying to make it to a neighbor's house. And I was like, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. So I decided to try and like turn around and go back over my driveway to another neighbor's house. And when I came up that embankment, he shot me in the leg, but I kept going. And then he shot me in the leg again. And I fell over in the middle of my driveway and I was kind of laying on my side, looking at the garage door, hanging off the hinges. And then I saw him walk up that embankment to the edge of the driveway, just a couple of feet from me. And I watched him shoot me two more times. And I knew that I was paralyzed with the last shot because I felt this jolt of electricity going through my body from the bullet that hit my spinal cord. And um, I was just thinking to myself, oh my God, this is not happening. This is, this is not, you were so close to getting away, out, away from him and out of this madness. This is not happening. And then I saw him move out of the corner of my eye and so I'm laying on the driveway and he stood over me and I closed my eyes and I held my hand up. I didn't want to see his face. That was the last thing I had to see. And I held my hand up. I just, I just said like, don't shoot me anymore. I'm dying. And the only thing he said the entire time was he kind of looked down at me and he said, watch this. And he cocked the gun and he put it to his head and he pulled the trigger, but it clicked. He had used all the ammunition firing at me. And he kind of looked at the gun, he looked down at me <clears throat> and he, he ran off somewhere. And again, I knew my life was slipping away from me. And I just kept telling myself like, don't you close your eyes. Don't you close your eyes. You stay awake till there's someone here that can help you. And I felt, you know, this calming presence come over me and this time it wasn't my internal voice. It was a different voice. And, you know, I, I really think that was God's voice. And it, he said, if this is too much, it's okay to close your eyes. You'll be okay. 
but I was scared. You know, I kept thinking about my children and how we were so close to getting away from this and I didn't want it, you know? So I was like, no, I'm going to fight this. And then I heard my neighbor yelling, little did I know my neighbors had witnessed this because they heard me crash into the tree and they were all on 911 with, uh, you know, and I heard my neighbor yelling, stop shooting, stop shooting. The police are coming. And I heard faint sirens and I'm like, okay, you hang on till they get here. And they started to get louder. And then I saw him coming back up the driveway and I was like, oh God, please don't let him come over here. Please don't come, let him come back over here to me. And I think he thought I was dead, but he laid down next to the driveway by me and I heard a gunshot and I saw his legs kick up. Um, he had shot himself in the chest. Um, and then the next thing I knew there were police officers standing over me and from my local police department. And they were like, Janet, what happened? What happened? I'm like, he shot me, he shot me. And they were like, where is he? Where is he? And I was like, I think he's over there. You know, they couldn't see him because he had an all black. And, um, they kept asking me over and over who had shot me, who did it. And I kept thinking like, I've told you enough already. Where's the ambulance? That's what I want to know. Where's the ambulance? I found out later the reason they kept asking me that is because as more officers arrived, they needed multiple officers to hear me say who had shot me in case I didn't make it. And he did. So the next thing I knew, there were paramedics, you know, cutting my clothes off and asking me, where have you been shot? And I, I was, you know, it, it was weird. You know, I thought he had shot me in the bank at the back of the ankle. But no, he had shot me in the femur. I thought he'd shot me lower in my left leg, but he had shot me in the knee. So anyway, they're they're slapping these bullet bandages, they call them, over me to try and, you know, stop the bleeding. Um, they loaded me on a um, on a stretcher. Um, and that's when I started to feel pain. Um, but they put me in the back of the ambulance, you know, they had oxygen on me, and I mean, they were working as fast as they could. And um, there were two paramedics in the back with me. And I just remember telling myself, you do everything these guys tell you to do. You keep focused on them. And they would say, okay, Janet, we're 10 minutes from the hospital. Okay. And I'm like, 10 more minutes. Okay. I can hang on 10 more minutes. And then they would say five more minutes. I said, five more minutes. Okay. And then they'd say, we're turning into the hospital. And I was like, oh, thank goodness we made it. And then I knew we were in the ambulance bay because the ambulance kind of rocked back and forth going over the speed bump. Mm -hmm. And then I don't remember what happened after that. I, I blacked out. Um, but I woke up three and a half weeks later uh, in the hospital. Um, he had shattered my right femur, shattered my, he shot me six times, shattered my right femur. He shattered my left knee. I have it through and through in my thigh, right by your main artery there. He shot me in the back and it came out here. Um, he shot me in the side and it took out a third of my right lung. And then the last shot uh, hit my L2 vertebrae. So I was uh, paralyzed, a paraplegic. And um, I just remember my parents saying when I woke up, like, you're safe. 